Armchair Detective, a new kind of mystery that challenges your imagination. With H. Allen Smith as your crime authority, and John Milton Kennedy as your armchair interrogator. So, you want to be a detective, huh? You think you know who done it before it's been dead? Well, all right. We're going to challenge you to a battle of wit. You against the detectives in our case enactments. But uh, don't let that frighten you, because these detectives know no more than you do. And the clues they look for are right in plain sight for you to see, too. Do you think you can beat them? Okay, we'll see. First, I want you to meet our host for this evening. He's that well-known young Los Angeles attorney, former special agent with the FBI, currently an assemblyman to the California State Legislature. It gives me pleasure to present to you Mr. H. Allen Smith. Al, welcome to another session of Armchair Detective. Thank you very much, John Kennedy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to Armchair Detective. We have two new cases for you this evening. Say, you know, we haven't seen much of Inspector Kane lately. And I understand that our first case tonight finds him in most unusual surroundings. Uh, yes, it does. Say, tell me, have you ever been in a hobo jungle? <laughs> Not recently, Al. But there was a time during the housing shortage when even a, a hobo jungle would have looked almost good. I see what you mean. Say, now, my question to you, and to you armchair detectives, is what were the clues that led Inspector Kane to arrive at the scene when he did to make the arrest? Did you get that, John? Uh, give it to us again. Okay. Watch for the clues that led Inspector Kane to arrive at the scene when he did to make the arrest. Well, good. I can hardly wait for some of that mulligan stew. Well, then let's go out to the city limits, underneath the railroad trestle, where we'll meet a couple of mighty unusual characters. George. George, where are you? Why didn't you stay in one place like I told you? Don't speak to me like that. Whether you're still my valet, you speak respectfully or I'll discharge you. All right, Mr. Barlow, go ahead and discharge me. I can't very well do that, can I? Well, come along, help me to get cleaned up. You don't need to get cleaned up. We're supposed to be hobos, remember? We were lucky enough to get our new clothes changed for these old ones this morning without having those tramps tell the police we were in. Oh, it's too dangerous. Let's get out of here. No. This is the last place the police would look for a man with your money. It's the best place in the world. Some bum got you a bottle while I was away, didn't he? Well, what's the difference? Is there anything that makes hiding out like this possible? I could stay as drunk as I was that night on the train when my wife was killed. You mean when you killed her? I didn't kill her. What do you mean I killed her? I didn't kill her. Yeah, I think this too. I tell you, she was killed and the train was wrecked. What about the people who heard you threaten to kill her when you were dining in the club car? Oh, that doesn't mean anything. The police know she went down to her berth and was shot before the wreck. They've got your gun with your fingerprints on it for proof. Well, if I'd have done it, I'd have thrown the gun out of the window. The wreck prevented you from doing that. You didn't have a chance. But I... Yes. Yes, I guess you're right. Yes, they'd have probably convict me. They never would have believed my story. But you believe me, don't you, George? What's the difference, Mr. Barlow? We've got to clear out of the country when it's safe to travel. I'll make some coffee. I appreciate your loyalty, George. That was due to the fact that you knew that I had $50,000 hidden in cold cash near the scene of the wreck. How'd you know I had it on me, George? Now that gets to know lots of things, Mr. Barlow. Well, it's too bad you don't know that I didn't kill my wife. 
Oh, when that wreck happened, I got this awful bump on the head. And I saw her dead. I didn't know how badly I was hurt. I <coughs> could only think of hiding that money somewhere. I'd been found with a sum like that on me that have been many questions asked. And they'd have outbid me in that deal in the East. <laughs> Lucky I learned about your wife and found you before you got back to the wreck. Well, come on. Well, it was lucky the blinders came on after you hid the money. You should tell me where it is, Mr. Barlow. Let me get it. It isn't safe. Oh, and trust you to bring it back to me now, George. I'm not that much of a fool. <laughs> well, read me what the newspapers have to say today. Nationwide search for Frederick Barlow, wealthy stockbroker accused of murdering his wife, continues. Ballistic experts claim that the bullet which killed Mrs. Barlow came from a 38 caliber revolver found in Mr. Barlow's berth. The gun contained a perfect set of his fingerprints. Mrs. Barlow's handbag is missing, and it is presumed taken by Mr. Barlow when he disappeared from the scene of the wreck. Hey, give me that paper! Well, what's this? Wait. Wait. It's, it's her handbag. I gave it to her, but... Yes, it's got her initials on it. How did you come by it, George? All right, Barlow. You gotta tell me where you hid the money. You gotta tell me right now. This is a knife in your belly, so go on. Start talking. Stop it, George. Who's there? Who, who's that? Never mind. Take it easy, Mr. Barlow. I'm Inspector Kane of the Homicide Bureau. I'll see that you get to the hospital right Inspector, away. Inspector, why, police, that means that, that I'm under arrest? Not you, Mr. Barlow, no, but your valid is. No, you're only a missing persons case. Why, well, what do you mean, man, I'm only a missing persons case? Just what I said. You can be thankful that you, uh, didn't close with those hobos. <laughs> Here's a panhandler wearing a $250 suit. It's, uh, it's enough to make homicide do a little questioning. Homicide? Yeah. That means murder. You said it was only a missing person's case. That's right, George. But you, you said I'm under arrest. There's a mistake here somewhere, Inspector. A big mistake. Yes, there certainly is, George. Things aren't working out as you planned it, are they? But she wasn't murdered. She was killed in the wreck. I just told him that. I was just trying you to... You were trying to get the money. And if you had got it, you'd have had to kill him anyway. Because as soon as he learned he wasn't wanted for murder, he would have been after us, you see? Is that what you mean, George? Oh, yes. But it was only the money. I didn't kill his wife. I wasn't going to kill well, him. How do you account for the fact that you had his gun and her handbag? Come on, give it to me, George. Why, I, I, Inspector, I just went down to the compartment to see if he was all right. You went down there hoping to find him unconscious so you could steal the money then. Well, yes, I did. But, but it was only the money. When I saw he was blinded, I just told him about his wife. That's all there is to it. Yes, that was a great mistake, George. A very great mistake. You mean... You mean she was murdered? Uh, I didn't even know about it. Somebody else must have done it. Oh, no. He did kill her. Why, you... Hold it, George. Let go of me. Sit down, Mr. Morrow. Now, give him some coffee, George. And show me how a good servant takes care of his, his employer. Boiling hot. So be careful, Mr. Barlow. I'm sorry I have no way of cooling it for you. Unless you'd like me to... Stop that gun, Inspector, or I'll cut his throat! All right, George. You won't get out of here. I'm going to try. I'm not going to have a murder charge pinned on me. So throw me that other gun and be careful how you do it.
<laughs> You'll find it's not so hard, George. Especially if you have a true and faithful servant to look after you. Well, now, John, do you and you armchair detectives remember the question I propounded to you about this case? Yes, Al, I think so. Uh, you wanted us to watch for the clues which led Inspector Kane to arrive upon the scene when he did and make his arrest. Yes, that's right. And did you get the tip that Un Inspector O'Kane gave as to why the homicide detail was interested? Yes, that expensive suit. And uh, I should certainly imagine when they questioned th that panhandler about it that he'd be only too happy to tell him where he got it in order to prove he didn't steal it. And incidentally, to prove that he didn't kill his benefactor to get it. Yes, so he led Inspector Kane right to that hobo camp. But I still don't see why the homicide inspector would be interested in the first place. Well, now, don't you think the fact that Mr. Barlow had $50,000 would give rise to the possibility of murder? No, I don't, Al, because he concealed the fact that he had that money. Well, uh, yes, uh, he did conceal the fact. But surely, after he'd been reported missing, the bank would have reported that he withdrew that large sum of money. Well, all right, I'll buy that, Al. But I I'll remain I'll remain stubborn and say that uh, a hobo found wearing a $250 suit would uh, call for nothing more than a routine checkup. Because how could the police know that it was Mr. Barlow at that hobo camp? Oh, but that's a most important clue, John. Well, I suppose you're going to say that the, the hobo could give a description to the police of Mr. Barlow. But I got you there, Al. Because if he described Barlow to the police, he would have simply said, a blind man gave me the coat. And the police had absolutely no way of knowing that Mr. Barlow was blind. Well, now, that's a very good point. And you're getting warm, but how about working on the suit a little more? Oh, I suppose they would have removed all identifying papers from it. That's right, John. As a matter of fact, you're getting a little warmer. But what about the cost of the suit? Oh, I suppose that would indicate it was custom made. Right. Well, since it was custom made, uh, oh, I got it. All custom made suits have the, the owner's names uh, sewed in the lining of the inside coat pocket. And that sews up the case. Oh, now, wait a minute, Al. Hold everything. Oh, wow. What's the matter now? Well, just a little matter of Mrs. Barlow. Was she murdered or wasn't she? Well, no. As a matter of fact, she was killed in the wreck. And that gives rise to another question. You think Inspector Kane was justified in letting George believe that she'd been murdered? Well, yes, I think he was, Al, because at that point, the, the inspector didn't know that the police had assumed she'd been killed in that wreck. Yes, they assumed that she had been killed in that wreck, but uh, the incriminating evidence of, of the, uh, the gun and the handbag then made them go ahead and order an autopsy. Oh, that's spoken like a true criminologist, John. You're as sharp tonight as that new suit you're wearing. Yeah. Uh, darn that, Taylor. He must have forgotten to put so my name in there. <laughs> well, you've seen our first mystery, folks, and in a moment we'll have our second who done it. But first, a word about your teeth and their care. That's a mighty good tip, folks. And John, what about our second case? Well, I've heard rumors tonight, Al, that our second case is in direct contrast to the one we just witnessed. That's stating it mighty mildly. Well, if that's the case, then do you think Inspector Harrison will be able to handle it? Oh, don't worry about Inspector Harrison. You worry about yourself because there are going to be a lot of clues. Well, give me a running start and tell me where it takes place. All right. It's in a warehouse down by the waterfront. So get a good grip on your armchairs, detectives, because that's where we're going right now.
Go on, get in there. Shoving me. You're lucky if I don't do more than that to you. Hope you don't hang around outside. Do you know who I am? Sure I do. So I dragged you in here. You're Harry Monk's girlfriend. You mean I was his girlfriend until you kicked him out of the mob. So? Well, I don't like a two-time chiseler any more than you do, Jake. That's why I came in here to see you. Keep on talking, baby. Look, Harry knows about this warehouse. He figures you're handling some hot stuff or else you're doing some smuggling. No, well, he does, huh? That fink is really asking for a fast rub-out. And I'm the guy that can give it to him, too. You know, Harry, you're going to be a big man in this town someday. I like to stick with the winning team, if you know what I mean. Sure, I know you. I like a doll that knows the score. Now, you're going to be all right, baby. You want to sign me up right now, or would you like a sample of my teamwork? <laughs> Let's have the sample, huh? for first aid. Got to fix my makeup. <laughs> Somebody's trying to get in the front. Mm -hmm. I'll go see who it is. Harry. So you want to trade sides for well, the match? I was just trying to help you, Harry. Uh, I was going to find out what their racket was, and then I was going to tell you about it. Well, Harry, you got to believe me. Oh. Get in there. Harry, what are you going to do? Look, I wasn't trying to cross Shut you, up. Harry. What I decide to do depends on you. When he comes back here, tell him you thought you'd better hide. If he gets wise, I'll blast you both. But he'll take me back in there with him. And you'd love it. But maybe I'll go back there with you. Hey, babe. Babe, where are you? Oh. Hey, what's the idea? Well, I... I didn't know who it might be, Jake. I thought maybe I'd better hide. Oh, smart girl. It's a dick, all right, and he's trying to get in the front door with a pass key. Now, you stay here and I'll get rid of him. Oh, if he, uh, if he looks back here, it's okay. We were just doing a little smooching. coming to the door and letting me in, Jay. Oh, Inspector, you hurt me. I, uh, I didn't hear you knock. So, you know, it's uh, quite a coincidence you're uh, finding me here, a bit of a surprise. Uh, you see, uh, this warehouse isn't mine. <laughs> you mean it isn't in your name? I don't have a thing to do with the place. Now, why don't you tell me that you're not here at all? That I'm just having a bad dream. Well, you see, I uh, came here to meet somebody. Uh, you know, it's uh, kind of embarrassing. <laughs> Excuse me. The only thing that would ever embarrass you is the execution chamber. Well, now, I... Inspector, let's get down to cases, huh? What's in those cases back there? How should I know? Look, Harrison, you don't have anything on me. If you did, you'd take me down to headquarters. Thanks for leaving the door open, Jake. Mm. Hello, Inspector. Didn't expect to see you here. Ah. If it isn't a gathering of the clan. Ah, Harry, would it be embarrassing for you to tell me who you came here to meet? No, of course not. I followed my girl down here. I saw Jake drag her inside. You don't, sir. Well, now, aren't you a little bit late rushing to her rescue? 
Or did you go home to get your trusty rescue rod? Ah, I don't carry no rod. Oh? oh? Then it must be that you took courage when you, uh, when you saw me coming. Yeah, that's it. It's your duty to find out what he did to him. Yeah? And how do you suggest that I go about doing my duty? Why, search the place, of course. He might even have knocked her off. Just because she's my girl. Oh? Then I take it there are strained relations between you two, uh, Casanova. Okay, she's back there. But the only thing that's happened to her is that she's fallen for me. Do they have to get a knife in their back to fall for you, Jake? I told you he killed her. His fingerprints are on that knife. Smear of blood on the front sole of her dress. What about that knife, Jake? Is it yours? Well, uh, yes, uh, that is it. It was on my desk. No. I didn't kill her, Inspector. You know I didn't. He's lying. What more proof do you want? Quite a bit more. Okay, give it that. Harry, I have a little surprise for you. Jake couldn't have killed her because her body wasn't there when I looked before. And I've been with him ever since. I know it wasn't. I mean, I know why it wasn't. You know why, Inspector? Because one of his mob put her there. That's how she got there. Yeah. That's a brilliant deduction, Harry. Shake. Why? That's a nasty splinter on your finger. You're still bleeding. Well, they'll give you first aid down at headquarters. Why do you both answer a lot of questions? Now look, all you gotta do is have to get one of my mouth and there's a job for me. Gentlemen, don't get so excited. Now, Harry, all you have to do is prove you weren't in the warehouse in the last ten minutes. And Jake, all you have to do is explain your fingerprints on a knife in your new girlfriend and Harry's old girlfriend's back. Shall we go? You've seen the mystery, and in a moment we'll have the solution. But first, let's look at the answer to another kind of problem. John, uh, I have a lot of questions for you and for you armchair detectives, so I hope you're as sharp as you were in the last case. <laughs> Al, I'm sure this case was duck soup for us armchair detectives, so fire away, pour out the questions. Okay. Now, since Harry's defense would have been that he wasn't in the warehouse at the time the crime was committed, what clues would prove he was there? Oh, he left lots of them. Lots of them. Yes, that's true. Harry wasn't too smart. And in attempting to plant the fingerprints of Jake on the knife in such a clever manner, so he thought, he forgot a lot about a lot. He forgot about a lot of other things. But what were they, John? Well, he would have. Uh, the police would have found that gun he left in the crate. Yes, that's true. They would have searched for that. And he got a splinter from one of the crates. Yes, you know that's important because the laboratory might establish that the splinter was from the same wood as the crate. Yes, and uh, that blood smear on the girl's shoulder would have indicated that his hand had been there. Yes, and that might be a clue as to the manner in which she were killed. And that would be particularly true if there were markings on the crate left by the knife handle. Yes, that's right. And you know, Harry put his hand down into the crate. There might be some fragments of sawdust on his sleeve. Why, of course. And even Harry wouldn't claim that he got it from a sawmill. No, that's very true. And obviously, the evidence of the fingerprints on the doorknob were the most important. And then in addition to that, John, if supposing Jake's fingerprints were on the knife, what would his defense be? Well, it would be a matter of common sense, I think. He would say even if he had killed the girl, uh, so what? He, he still wouldn't have been so stupid as to have one of his mob uh, put her body where the inspector could find it so easily. Yes, I think that's true, and he probably wouldn't have left his fingerprints on the knife anyway. And as it turned out, when Harry realized the amount of evidence against him, he readily, committed, readily admitted to the manner in which he killed her. Well, Al, these have been two very fascinating cases this evening, and I'm sure you'd like to introduce the members of the cast. Yes, I would, John. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, it's my pleasure to present the cast to you. In the first scene, Harry Martin was the valet, and Mr. Frederick Tozer was Mr. Barlow, Cy Kendall as Inspector King. In the second scene, Kay Lee as Madge, Bert Davidson as Jake, Ken Harvey as Harry, and Jerome Sheldon as Inspector Harrison. And ladies and gentlemen, that about winds up our show for this evening. And so until next week, same time, same channel, 
On behalf of John Milton Kennedy, our armchair interrogator, and the rest of the cast, this is your crime authority, H. Allen Smith, wishing you all a very pleasant good evening. Be sure to...